Good evening. It is approximately 5.30 p.m. on Tuesday, July 19th, 2022, and this regular meeting of the Sandpoint Planning and Zoning Commission is now called to order in council chambers at City Hall, 1123 West Lake Street, Sandpoint, Idaho. For the record, I am Chairman John Hastings, presiding. Also present are Commissioners Mo Stunkel, Luke Ahmet, Amelia Boyd, Ben McGran, and Nick Polito. Absent this evening is Slate Kemp. We will now recite the Pledge of Allegiance. If everyone will please stand. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Are there any other general announcements from the commissioners or from city staff? I have one. I would just like to welcome Nick Polito to um, the commission. Welcome. Thank you very much. Welcome indeed. First on the agenda is approval of the meeting minutes. I will entertain a motion to approve the minutes from the July 5th, 2022 meeting. So moved. Second. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes and the minutes are approved. Uh, new business, the next item on the agenda this evening is a discussion of the comprehensive plan update. I will now yield the floor to city planner, planner Amy Tweeten for an overview of status and next steps. Um, tonight, uh, what I wanted to um, get, I feel like we restarted, <laughs> is um, back to work on the comprehensive plan. We had a few months where we had a lot of uh, other stuff. development applications, so that has to take precedence. Um, and so just um, bringing us all up to speed where we are now and moving forward where we're going um so again part of the reason we were holding off was really we wanted that data from the leland study because that was going to get that reintegrated into some of the work that had previously been done to update the data um so we didn't want to get too far down the road before we had that um but now you see that um that report has been drafted it's still in the, the refinement stages um, the strategic planning of city council was adopted um, and then we did enter the contract um, or amended the contract for logan simpson council approved that in june <clears throat> um, there's still work going on on the utility side but those efforts that were all going to be informing the comprehensive plan or helping to update what had already happened pretty much through that phase now. So we're now, um, we had gotten, you know, I think back in April, May, we did, I went through what the vision statements were with the commission. Um, and that is what I provided you in the packet um, for the meeting uh, is the, you know, the first two chapters and kind of how the information to date has been formatted. This is more of the background information. Um, So on the, uh, just on the timeline, um, so we'll talk a little bit about these first two chapters and that those of you who are on the commission were involved in the 2019 update to that airport chapter, but that's also included in here. And so that gives you an idea really of how the chapters are going to be formatted. Um, but going forward, um, August 2nd, just to give you a timeline in terms of what I see in terms of development for duties that I know are coming first in the meetings, we can focus exclusively on the comprehensive plan and then where we may need to schedule some special meetings. Um, August 2nd, we do have a preliminary plan that will be coming forward, but we will probably have some time on the comp plan at that meeting. August 16th is going to be exclusively 
um, on the comprehensive plan. I'm still working with the consultants to see if they can do a remote workshop um, at that meeting. Um, and then the September 9th meeting, your regular meeting for the first of the month, I will not be here. We do not currently have any applications on that agenda. Um, and I don't know that we will. So I may see if you'd be willing to reschedule that meeting um, so that we could schedule it for another date and that, that would be an exclusive comprehensive plan meeting as well. Um, so I'll reach out to you if possible dates could be either August 23rd, which would be on the third Tuesday of August, um, or a special meeting in September. So just wanted to give you a heads up on that, that we may be canceling the regular September 9th meeting. Do, do you mean September 6th? September 6th, you're right. Okay. It's not the 9th. Yeah. So, Amy, um, I have a question. Yes. Is there going to be a joint meeting like we did with the Leland study with with council about the comp plan, or is that there will be as we get into it a little bit more deeper? But we will definitely do a joint meeting. Okay. Thank you. All right. So. Um, just wanted to go briefly through the information um, that was sent. Again, that first chapter is the introduction to the plan. So it gives background information. Um, this is again, I mean, there'll be a whole, a whole section of the plan on uh, the area of city impact. Um, but the, the boundary, there was a map here of the, well, the current ACI, but that will be the updated ACI. Then it just goes through, you know, legal reasons uh, for the and the required elements of a comprehensive plan um, per state statute. Where we have been planning historically in the community, um, as well as changes that have occurred as a result, really, of the last plan. Could I interrupt for a question before you proceed further? And that was going back to the ACI. Does the adjustment of that ACI boundary have to be approved by any other jurisdictions other than the city of Sandpoint? It is negotiated with the council. Okay, gotcha. When, when do we expect that to occur? The approval of, of that ACI? Um, they because they lost the county planner, it's been delayed a little bit, but they're going to try and get it um, started yet this summer and into the fall. And we hope to have it negotiated by the end of the year. Uh, so then just a review of uh, the public participation that has occurred to date. And then really what is the layout, how is the organization of the plan going to be laid out to make sure we are covering all the required components of um, state law. Um, so again, these are the first two chapters, the introduction and the community vision. Uh, and then I think the next, the ones that I have asked consultants to kind of bring forward to the commission to do workshops to make sure that, um, again, what the, the community said and is incorporated into the plan under um, first, I, I think we'll try to do the more straightforward ones first, which is community character and design. We'll probably skip over land use growth, housing. I think land use growth and housing, those are two we are going to have to do workshops on because that's where we really have, you know, there's a lot of goals and objectives around um, infill, keeping community character, and what does that mean? And so how do we move that forward when we're, you know, we need clear goals and objectives and strategies 
so that when we are updating the zoning ordinance, it's reflective of what it says in the plan. And those, those are the areas I see from the different components where there's definitely conflict between some of the goals and objectives. Um, so I think those are two areas we definitely need to do workshops around. Um, chapter six is multimodal transportation. There was the whole um, master plan done on that. And a lot of that work will get pulled into this chapter, Park and Recreation and Trails. And again, there was a master plan done for that. Public facilities and utilities, um, that's one that I think will have more importance under this plan than perhaps it has in the past. Just the importance of our, particularly our, our utilities and how it relates to growth and development. Um, then jobs and economic development, a lot of the information from the Leland report kind of informs that chapter. Um, then you have, um, they're provided for tonight, the chapter 10 um, public airport facility that was updated in 2019, and then the natural resource and hazard areas. So those are the, the way the chapters are laying out for the actual plan. Yeah, just um, that this the comprehensive plan is broad goals. Um, it's a policy direction that is kind of overarching all these other documents, but all the other plans should fit into it. Um, but the comprehensive plan may not have the level of detail as some of these other sub area plans. Those will always exist in a little more detail. We just want to make sure that. The comprehensive plan is saying something completely different than some sub area plan that we have. The profile, some of this, I think they had already updated from the Leland study, but this will get updated a little more. Some of this will get updated as well, but some of the data. Um, this was one where and I didn't get a chance to ask them. Uh, I, it looks like before the Leland uh, report, they were using a 3.4 or over 3% growth um, rate. And I think what the Leland report is looking at is close to 2.4. Could I ask a question? Kind of just if you backed up to that, actually the sand, the little Sand Creek watershed map. I was just curious. I know a couple of years ago there was an effort by uh, the BLM to try and swap land with the Forest Service uh, because they didn't really want any holdings up here in North Idaho. Do you know if any of that is still trying to happen, or would, it, would that in any way impact this? I, they're both federal agencies. I don't suppose it would. I don't think it would affect the conversation plan process. Um, if, if it's all the watershed um, property, um, I'm sure we would be happy to. I was just curious if there was still any of that discussion. Not that I'm aware of. So then the community vision, again, we did, I kind of ran through this um, a few months ago, um, just these are the vision So the, the vision very much follows the, um, the pillars of the vision are following the pillars of the city strategic plan. So responsive government, um, again, that's so that's the first um, <clears throat> pillar and resilient economy, sustainable development, agriculture. 
for the whole community. I have one question on the livable community page right there as well. Um, I can't, it, it came up in the, the Leland study and it's something that I might concur with. And that is when we talk about housing needs in Sandpoint, um, I don't think it's, when we talk about affordable housing, I, I don't think that's something that market forces will ever accomplish. And they had talked about um, public private partnerships. And I'm curious if that is a phrase that would benefit us to put in this section of the document that we are, however it might be worded, open-minded, willing to explore, looking for, but public-private partnerships so that people might know that is something we're interested in. Right, um, and I think that probably would be, we can put it in the vision, but we would probably also put it in our um, goals and objectives, that that is um, in the housing chapter, the housing and neighborhoods chapter, um, that's certainly true. That and, and that it needs to be a regional solution um, because yep. the city can't solve it. Right. Yeah. Not only housing the problem here, although, so both the regionalism and, well, I shouldn't use that word, both the um, intergovernmental cooperation and um, public private partnerships, I think, will come across as strong um, objectives and or actions. Excellent. So do you want me to go through, I, I have to go through what this uh, responsive I looked it over and have no questions. I don't know if other people do, or if there's anything they'd like to see more detail presented. I'm just curious of, is there a, a ranking here? Like why responsive government government first? I don't think there's a priority. Um, I think if you look, I think it's just following their graphic. I think it's this natural inclination that when you see this, it feels like that's the priorities. And as a community member, I, I don't know. I'm sure there's very different opinions on what the priorities of these are, but um, for me, it's probably more maybe almost in, inverse of this, that a livable community is probably, would be from a real estate standpoint, my priority, but I think it's just a perception, right? Like what's the priorities? Mm -hmm. I think since they're city council pillars, right? If I remember it's council strategic plan, yeah. that's what these are. I think, um, I think it's just, my impression is that it just goes from being a responsive government because that's where it's coming from, their strategic mm -hmm. plan and then just informing or just giving the information out there of what the plan is and then going down the line, I don't think. In, that's my opinion. It just doesn't seem like it's a priority. I just think it's a more informational type. Yeah. And these are these. Um, I mentioned that we're going to just to because it has been a while since the workshops. Uh, these are the statements that are going to be uh, put in a survey. <coughs> sent out just that people agree or disagree that these are state vision statements that they think are important to the comprehensive plan. And I actually, to your point, Beth, I didn't put in the ones about responsive government because um, it is more about responsive government is how we will get to these things, but all the other areas are much more say land use and community related. Right. Um, the responsive government is needed to implement all of those. Um, but I actually didn't put these four bullets in the survey. Okay. Next is the 
is the airport facility. This was just updated in 2019. A lot of really, really good information. And clearly the goals are to protect back up Amy to the previous page there's one thing that really stuck out to me and it's right there key existing developments and proposed zoning are not in alignment with ITD euro arrow guidance and post potential conflicts within key zones such as recommended lateral safety zone and inner critical safety zones that really stuck out to me is there any uh, are we in that process of making sure we don't have the malalignment, like it says? Um, well, we, we're much more sensitive now to it, obviously. Than we um, and clearly the denial of the Schweitzer cutoff CUP was the first big action that this was, it was seen as very, uh, not compatible with this chapter. Um, so there, you know, if there are land use actions like a rezone or a conditional use permit, we look closely. But again, if you think of there's there's other actions like lower pines subdivision that uh, they're not asking for us to change anything. Um, that talk about um, we have the air, airport overlay zone but pine rate does not um, and that's just trying to get more of that intergovernmental cooperation both with the other jurisdiction and then with the county and you know to make sure we are all on the same page but does the does the zoning map that we have does it reflect um I guess the airport guidance and that, does it show it? Does it outline it? Yeah, it okay. has the airport critical. So there's a lot of on our zoning map. Got it. Yeah. Okay. And has that been updated based off of this report or when when was the most recent update of that? Because you said that there was the land use was denied, but. That there was, um, that was, January, there, there had been a request for a residential development right. um, recommended by the Planning and Zoning Commission and, Council, and then it was appealed to City Council right. and City Council overturned it. The, the zoning was in place at that point because we have both the amendments to the comprehensive plan and then we also have the Native Court chapter of the zoning ordinance. You said it was or wasn't? It was. Oh, it was. Okay. Yeah, we adopted this in 2019, pretty early in the year. But to, to like go over that, it, none of the zoning has changed in there. It's, we notify people, or it has to be in the deed that they're in, a, in that zone. And, oh, so people are, uh, property owners are notified when they're in that zone, and then a whole development can't be entirely in that zone or only a small portion of it can be. Is that right? Because we did approve a subdivision that had a small corner that was in the inner critical zone, right. but only a, like a very small part of it. So we still could approve housing in the inner critical zone. But we we want to try to not to or or de high density 
is is not a goal there. What you're precluded from doing at this point is approving a zone change that increases density. So the zoning that's there can be it, used. Yes, and you, you've had projects come before you in the existing zoning asking only to do what they're allowed to do within that zone, but not asking for a zone change to increase density. So, and again, this, this is showing how um, through the chapters, it's going to, when there is a goal and that objectives, it's going to identify what, what part of the vision those are uh, trying to direct us towards. So who's the author of these goals? Um, the goals were uh, compiled by the consultants. Um, as a result of the public outreach. Okay, so this is Logan Simpson. Yes. Okay. And is this chapter considered a finished document? Yes. If you this, will? Chapter, yes. this chapter was already adopted. Yep. Um, and I don't think there's any, there have been any updates to it. I, we can try to look to see if there's maybe data that we would, you know, if the number of flights in and out have dramatically increased, we probably want to update that before we complete the plan. Mm -hmm. But overall, it's the same thing. Uh, so that is all I have, I'm afraid. <laughs> um, but like I said, I um, the August meetings will be focused on comp plan, and then hopefully, if we can get us one special meeting and uh, schedule either August or September, that will also be a focus. Um, we're trying to get as much of the um, you know the workshops and everything done. Uh, no later than October, November, so that then the actual completing the document and then having the whole approval process, public meetings, uh, will occur during winter, during winter. And then we still have a target to adopt the plan. I have a general question about that. And I know, uh, you know, at our last joint meeting with and going over the Leland study. Um, most of that was completed before we saw the impacts of COVID on our community in terms of um, remote workers and, uh, and that's, that population moving into the area. I'm curious if there's any, if it's even conceivable to update data, um, uh, if we think it's a significant change that's not reflected in that study because it was completed prior to the impacts of the COVID economy on Sandpoint. Do you mean the... I mean, most of their data and their growth projections, I, I think they're not terribly accurate anymore, <laughs> even though it's two years old, but those two years have been enormously significant. You're talking about the Leland study. Correct. Yeah. I think that was 
a lot of those numbers were based on the 2020 census. And then they did have some numbers from April of 2021. But not frequently. Yeah, I mean, they tried to get I mean, they, yeah, I don't know. That's it. It's like I said, is it even conceivable? Is there more data? Is, and I don't know. I don't know where they would. The intent behind the study was to get the most current data. Yeah, and that might be it. And, and that might be you know, it. Again, data, uh, particularly census data lags quite a bit. Yes. But, um, you know, if there's other ways we can get an information, right. it is, you know, I think probably the most most updated data we had was that IRS data in terms of um, incomes, um, people moving into the community and people moving out. Um, but so much data is, you know, there's a lag for when they collect it, but I understand the point and that that was the whole purpose of getting updated right. data. Um, the other challenge we have is being a small because most data sources don't go below the county level or yeah. a county that is our population. So I don't know that we, unless we do our own studies and, right. and, and you I, know. So I think we have as current data as we're going to be able to. But it is that, you know, even if we don't have the discussion or if we don't have the specific data, we definitely need to talk about. I mean, they mentioned Zoom counts that, right. that we yeah. have had the impact of remote workers. Is there data on that? They didn't share any if there is. Um, but we certainly need that discussion in the comprehensive plan, if not. And, and I don't know if it's changed much over the summer, but I know last spring, I know that the, at the high school, they were preparing for a dramatically increased population at the high school, which is reflective, obviously, of the population or the type of population moving here. And they were basing that on? Kids who had already enrolled, new students who had already enrolled for the, this coming fall. So they were, they were getting, it wasn't, they weren't starting in the younger grades, they were coming in. Well, and I don't know about the younger grades because I was at the high school. So I, I, all I know is at the high school, right. but yeah. Okay. Yeah, and we definitely, um, part of the public facilities, right. you know, that whole chapter um, will need to include school district data. Yeah. yeah. Was there any data included in that that came from like our utility addresses and stuff like that. Yeah, I mean, they, they did use some, and that, that's, they have some of the utility data, that's what informed the decision to go with the 2.4%, um, just watching utility usage no. was the, is it, I think, I think it is the county, I think the county plan is using like a 3.5% growth rate. So they had that, range of 3.5 the county was using and then I think the state demographer was only projecting one point something um, but based on what they're seeing at the utility usage is where they came up with the 2.4. Another question that I didn't ask that night but it fleetingly went through my brain when we talked about intergovernmental cooperation uh, the one jurisdiction that never came up was Sago, and is that because they're not a township? I mean, not a, not a town. Um, I mean, obviously they have a huge impact on Sandpoint. I'm just <coughs> curious. We remember this question came up before, Did it? and Fonda, I think, looked up what exactly Sago is. They're not a town. They're not a village. They're. I mean, they're not an incorporated area. Um, they're just so considered they're rural Bonner County. Incorporated Bonner County, but yeah. they get a nameplate. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's interesting that they, they, where I came from in Michigan, they would probably be considered a township, which is just a jersey. Yeah. You know, it's a geographic boundary. Mm -hmm. um, but you don't have townships here. So it's not that. And they don't have any elected government? That's no. okay. Gotcha. 
We have a joint powers agreement with say or with there'd be nobody to have it with fire <laughs> fire department or the Selkirk fire. That's about the only thing I could think of that has any kind of government organization, and that's probably mostly on our end. Yeah, we don't provide any other services in Sagal other than fire. We have lot, we actually have lots of interjurisdictional uh, agreements. Right. That, um, probably put, put more information in the plan about those that has historically been there, just it's complicated. So, at the end of your presentation. End of my presentation. Commissioners, do we have more questions? Yeah, uh, just kind of a comment is um, uh, the information I thought was, some of it was um, not alarming, but it was a little surprising. And the growth was uh, the big one, I think. I mean, I, the, the general consensus in the public is that the growth is out of control. But that study helped me to see that what I feel like is a growth is, you know, it's manageable. So I don't think we need to have like a big, huge reaction to this massive flood of people that probably aren't going to come, you know, all at once. Because um, this has happened about every 10 years or maybe a little more than 10 years since I've been a little kid here. So we, we've had this... Um, you know, gearing up for a big influx of people. And then by the time we're in the middle of planning for it, there's a recession and people are moving away. I was looking at the population number went down almost a thousand people and from 2008 to 2010. And I don't think we're looking at that right now, but um, with the numbers that came in with that study, um, you know, being nearly three years old, it's probably the best we're gonna get and then factoring in that, you know, we're probably looking at a slowdown that could be significant for an extended period. I felt like the numbers probably line up pretty good um, and maybe are a little bit short, but, but I, I thought about the same thing. Like, you know, how do we get better, you know, up to date stuff? And there's really no way besides doing our own study and that's probably going to push this out another another year or something <laughs> and we're kind of you know overdue already so because i think the last update was 2009 the last major overhaul yeah. yeah so we're within that but um <clears throat> i had some questions about how do how do we or what part do we have in um shaping like zone adjustments or changes or or this area of city impact what what role do we have in guiding that or what what can we do to prepare ourselves to to make the best decisions on that is it you know outside of these meetings of course um well um the the negotiation will be not just I mean, your area of city impact is areas you may intend to annex into. Um, so the recommendation of the fleet room, and I think it probably didn't happen, is come up with a whole sub-area plan of what are the land uses you think are going to happen in the ACI? What is the transportation network? What's the utility network? Um, what are the, you know, most likely in our ACI, the land use is going to be residential, but what density is residential? So once you kind of come up with what are your densities of, of um, land uses, then um, the county, you know, there are some county municipal areas of city impact where they negotiate zoning that what, what codes can apply in the ACI. Um, but I mean, either, you know, we may use some of our, the same zoning that we have 
within the city boundary, or we may come up with totally different zoning categories and base that. Okay. But I think until we get a little farther along in negotiations with the county, um, we won't know exactly, we won't go down the zoning path right away. Um, so inside the city, the current city limits, as far as zone adjustments or or any changes or new zoning, um, kind of the same thing. What our needs are based on that study, where what areas can handle it, and what areas want it or need it. Um, is that kind of the same approach? Yeah, and that'll all be that'll be working through the future land use map. Um, and if you know there's areas now that we're showing as um, you know, right now we have what are called character areas, um, which are a little hard to understand. I'll go to the character area 1.5 is so you could also do a future land use map to just talk, you know, if it's not zoning, but it says this is high density residential area. This is a medium density residential area. This is a mixed residential area um, to just make it a little more uh, refined. So you can look at a land use map. It's not a zoning map, but it gives you a better idea of the land uses in that area. Um, and I think as we're going through the land use map update, there are areas that will probably be We we have to be careful because a city initiated zone change affects people's personal property rights. So when we do the future land use map, um, that's going to drive whether or not we need to do a city initiated zone change for the current zoning. But we have to be really careful that we don't take any individual property rights away in performing that transition. We have that going on um, right now in the city of Hayden. So when they did their comprehensive plan in 2019 and adjusted their future land use map, they also eliminated residential multifamily as a zone under the, basically the, a trade-off for moving those parcels into mixed residential or single family residential, depending on what the current use on the parcel is. Well, that affected 547 parcels. And you can imagine that the what the individual landowners did when they found out their zone was going to change and they didn't quite yet understand what that meant. So a city initiated zone change that affects people's personal property rights, if not handled with kid gloves, um, can create a lot of chaos. And so we'd be really, um, I would caution us to be really careful if we end up needing to go down that route. I have a question, Amy. Uh, when, when we first met, we were talking about <clears throat> this document and some of the contradictions that were happening uh, from the amendment to the original document. Does this new iteration of the document satisfy those, those contradictions? Um, we're not quite there yet, but we clearly will have um, goals and objectives that conflict. Um, you know, so there's a lot of discussion about protecting community character, but allowing infill development, um, uh, allowing it, and uh, enhancing downtown is the center of the community. You know, so all there's there there's always going to be. Um, Certain, you know, because you get a broad, you know, you get a lot of input at the beginning, you have all these goals and objectives, they don't always like, you know, there, there's, I, I would say we'll always have a little bit of that. Thank you. Yeah, we, so we've had that with the grid street pattern. <laughs> We just want to bring the grid type street patterns in in a new development uh -huh. that's on the comprehensive plan but we've been very it's been very hard to maintain that so 
just a personal note, like some stuff in the plan just just doesn't fit for a lot of development. And so I, I don't know, do we take it out or do we change it to a different, or do we say, well, we want that ideal where possible, where, where it can happen. Cause in the plan, I feel like it says that it sh that is an ideal that should be like strongly, you know, met, you know, but as we've seen since in my short time here is I think we've only had a couple developments maybe that could even come close to maintaining or adding that you know city street city block um look and um so yeah there's there's definitely contradictions that make it tough to decide you know um you know are we going to try to maintain that or are we moving in a totally different direction or is it just because there's so many of these smaller developments that don't really take up enough acreage to have enough street coverage. Although I feel like some of them have definitely had enough room. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, uh, that's for me, learning about the comprehensive plan has been like uh, a guide that sometimes is, is just a guide. It's not like, I don't know, it's not exactly law. It's not exactly um, zoning law, but yeah, the character of the community where possible, it should be adhered to. And yeah, so that's, I agree. It's, it's difficult to find that line where, where we're sticking with the comp plan, but we're also not, you know, not uh, affecting people's property rights or their development, you know, capabilities. So, um, yeah. I, and I most, yeah, I think I think that's a great example. And for Amy, who hasn't been here long enough, really, to have watched the commission struggle with this, and for some of the new commissioners, we've had some develop developments come forward. And when one of the standards of review is is this project consistent with the comprehensive plan, um, our commission has really struggled with some of those ideals of of you know the grid pattern streets. I think that's a great example. And so to the extent that we can clean up some of those pieces now is our opportunity because that has been difficult to analyze and and want to make a finding that it's consistent with the comprehensive plan, but yet it doesn't look consistent with the comprehensive plan. I think that part of the issue with that too is when we get a, a, a 20 acre, I mean a 20 home subdivision here and then it's open land around it if that was all developed at once, it would be a beautiful spot for a grid pattern. But when it's 20 homes now and 20 homes in two years and 20 homes in three years, I don't know how you would make that vision of what it would look like if it was all being developed at once, would make, which would make it more, more coherent and more in tune with the cut plan. But that's out of our purvey, I'm assuming. <laughs> it is the days where the farmers own most of the city. Yeah. And they plan it all at one time. Yeah, and a lot of this development is because of the market being, you know, favorable to where development can pay for itself. And if if you wait years, then the market's gone probably, and and then there'll be no street, no houses, anyway. So, yeah, I I feel like some of the stuff keeping those things in mind though has and we've mentioned it enough and developers have heard it and it is in the plan that some of the stuff that I see coming up, I think it does kind of start to follow that because out in the, that airport area and north of, um, uh, boy or west side of Boyer, there's a lot of area there that could follow the grid pattern and, and it makes more sense for developments anyway, I think. So I think they're seeing that and saying, well, we don't need to have like a cul-de-sac in every development when it could just go to the next street and be cheaper for them and make more sense for all kinds of reasons. So maybe we have kind of, you know, helped put the word out and, you know, eventually got that ideal back. So maybe it does stay in there. I don't know. I, I think, uh, I think you're right. Like it's, you know, if all the developers got together that had adjoining property, they could probably come up with a really good plan and spend less money too. 
um, and have it all come through in one application instead of you know two at a time. So. Any questions, comments from any commissioners? I'm done. <laughs> if there's no further business, I will adjourn this meeting at, I have to watch, here we go, 621. Thank you all for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.